We're about to get what is possibly a unique backstage view of how actors prepare for a Shakespearean role. Now, some of this work begins before rehearsals. Some of it goes on throughout an actor's life. I meet and have worked with many actors who approach Shakespeare and other classics thinking, how can I impose what I know, my own experience, upon this language, upon the character? Yet I believe the secret is to get inside the language and allow it to take you into places you yourself have never dreamt you'd reach, places where you've certainly never been before. And yet it takes hard work and practice to master this technique of speaking Shakespeare. Staying open and alive to his rhythms and imagery requires the same kind of flexibility and training that I imagine a skier must need to prepare for the rigors of the slopes. Both he and the actor require similar agility and sensitivity. Now, this workshop will focus on the particular vocabulary which takes us into the different worlds which Shakespeare creates. We'll look at the beginning of Hamlet and the beginning of the Midsummer Night's Dream, two very different worlds set up in the very first scenes. We'll also see how a speech is structured. There's nothing more terrifying for me than to be faced with a 30 or 40 line soliloquy. And it's only when I begin to understand the structure, the, the questions, the premise, the reasoning and the conclusion that the speech begins to open up and becomes less fearsome. We'll also hear how the sounds of the language are an intrinsic part of its meaning. The first scene in a Shakespeare play always takes us straight to the core of that particular world. That is the genius of the language. For instance, in the first scene of King Lear, the language is totally to do with quantity. How much? How much do you love me? He asks Goneril and Regan. And to their very effusive answers, he says, then you can have this much land. It is as if he has got property and love mixed in his mind, and he has no real judgment left. And this continues until he says to Cordelia, what can you say to draw a third, more opulent than your sisters, speak? And Cordelia answers, nothing. And that one word, nothing, rings out. It is the antithesis of all that has gone before. And this mixing of property and love informs us that there is something deeply wrong within Leah as a person. And when Cordelia says that word, nothing, it is as if she is trying to shock him into sense. Each play, you will find, tells us so much, so simply, by the undercurrent of the words, what we call today the subtext. I suppose I would like this work to be called Hearing Shakespeare, because the work is about hearing what is in there. We've got to hear what is that world, really. It takes away your responsibility to do everything. I think that's the important thing, that we hear something in the language which feeds us so that when we do start acting it in situ on the stage, that will also help us. It will be us, you know, ballast as it were, it'll, it'll earth us so that we don't have to do everything in the text. We don't have to make everything clear. We've got to be know what we mean in our minds and we've got to be specific, but it will reach more than you think if we are like that. Let us look at the beginning of two plays. First, A Midsummer Night's Dream, and then Hamlet. The Dream First. Now, 
A nuptial hour. Draws on a pace. Four happy days bring in another moon. But oh, methinks how slow. This old moon wanes. She lingers my desires. Like to a stepdame or a dowager. Long withering out a young Here, man's revenue. Here, the group is reading the first three speeches of the play between Theseus and Hippolyta. Each actor reading a line round in the circle so they can listen without any pressure to make sense. Something which is always a very freeing thing to do. And then we will do some exercises with it. Turn melancholy forth to funerals. The pale companion is not for our pomp. Hippolyta, I wooed thee with my sword. And won thy love, doing thee injuries. But I will wed thee in another key. With pomp, with triumph, and with reveling. Just read that last line again. With pomp, with triumph, and with reveling. Right, anything you want to say about that? Uh, Sounds happy. A lot of snappy yeah, words. Yeah, it's quite and... different from what we've been doing. It has, though, to me, the pomp. beginning of this, like, almost the, I say it, they're taking us into a dream. To me, I feel, it's like the spell is being cast Very now, good, yeah. fair, Paul, I feel like I'm being yeah. pulled into the dream of it, sort yes. of. And really, that language, that vocabulary, would not take us into any other play. This language takes us into this world. It is the world of the play, and it wouldn't take us anywhere. Yeah, the, else. Word, the words that jump out are amazing. What? Draws, nuptial, yes. wanes, moon, lingering. silver, yes. lingering, uh -oh. heaven, bow. With that in mind, can I have the two who are doing Hippolyta? And can you others not look at your page at all anymore and just repeat these words, which are to do with sexuality? Now. Fair Hippolyta, our nuptial hour draws apace. Four happy days bring in another moon. moon. But oh, methinks how slow this old moon wanes. She lingers my desires like to a stepdam or a dowager, long withering out a young man's revenue. <laughs> Four days will quickly steep themselves in night. Four nights will quickly dream away the time. And then the moon, like to a silver bow, new bent in heaven, shall behold the night of our solemnity. Go, Philistrate. Go. <laughs> <laughs> Stir up the Athenian so, youth for merriment. <laughs> Awake the pert in nimble uh, spirit of mirth. mirth. Turn melancholy yeah. forth to funerals that the pale companion is not for yeah. our pomp. Pom. Oh. <laughs> Hippolyta. Hippolyta. I wooed thee wooed. with my sword and sword. once I loved. <laughs> And won thy love, oh, no. doing the injuries. Oh, no. injuries. But I will wed thee in another key. Wait. With pomp, oh. with triumph, and oh. with reveling. Oh. I'll take all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> it's extraordinary, isn't it, when you really listen to that language? And you know, you, you listen to it so much, and you take it all for granted, and you accept it. I'd like you to go into the, what you go into that corner, and you go into that corner. And, um, right, and I'd like three handmaidens <laughs> to go with Lolita and three gentlemen, a hand gentlemen behind. Hand <laughs> <laughs> The first time through, speak as much as what your protagonist is speaking as possible without reading it. You can put everything down. I want them to feel that there is a sort of property in the language, but we'll ask them what they feel afterwards but then when I do it again through I want to, when I ask them to get together I want you to stop them getting together until they get to I woo the with the pale companion is not for our pomp and then just allow them okay. all right is this a paranoid exercise <laughs> <laughs> speak when you're ready now, fair Hippolyta, now, fair Hippolyta. Our, nuptial our nuptial hour draws apace. Four, Four happy days bring in another moon. 
But oh, me thinks oh, how me thinks slow how this slow old moon wanes. She lingers my desires my like eyes. to a stepdam or a dowager, long withering out long a withering young out man's young revenue. Young man's Four days will quickly steep themselves in night. Four nights will quickly dream away the time. And then the moon, like to a silver bow, new bent in heaven, shall behold the night of our solemnity. Go, Philistrate. Go, Philistrate. Stir up the Athenian youth to merriment. What I want you to feel is that there is a property in the language. Does that make any sense that you open it out and it's public speaking basically isn't it it's so it's bigger and that's all it that's all it's about all of the feminine and all of the masculine of the world are yes. coming at each other yes. rather than two people and if i were playing the part i'd feel intimidated how do i embody this much feminine this much men, you know but to imagine that yeah. behind me would help so the the exercise isn't entirely stupid <laughs> Also, the other sense you got in it was that they were unashamedly in love with each other. Right. That they weren't holding anything back. That it was like, I'm brilliant. giving all of myself oh, to fabulous. you and I'm giving all yeah, of myself oh, back to brilliant. you. To me, it was the support of the people behind that lift you and like it sort of felt like it lifted my words closer to her. But yeah, that's no, all I, I wanted you to feel, in fact. Now so. what I want you to do is to do it one more time and just try uh, and move towards each other. Now. Fair Hippolyta, <laughs> our nuptial hour draws apace. Four happy days uh, <laughs> bring in another moon. But oh, me thinks how slow this old moon wanes. She lingers my desires like to a stepdam or a dowager, long withering out a young man's revenue. <laughs> Four days will quickly steep themselves in night. Four now this was fun and perhaps a bit absurd, but it's useful to do something like this because it gives the actor permission to find the extravagance of the language without being self-conscious and judgmental. Pulling each other back or putting some sort of resistance there will help us to experience physically what is at stake the underlying danger in the language. So that when you come back to being serious, to making reason with it, you still keep something of its size and something of the delight in expressing it. We must always know what the language costs. But I will wed thee in another key, with pomp, with triumph, and with reveling. Not a chance. <laughs> Yeah, does that feel good? Now, without that, keep it, keep separate, but without all that, but really, could you feel how those vowels and everything were lengthening oh, you out? Oh, yes. Brilliant, okay. <laughs> now, ser for serious, for, for seriously. Okay, right, go. Now, fair Hippolyta, our nuptial hour draws apace. Four happy days bring in another moon. But oh, me thinks how slow this old moon wanes. She lingers my desires, like to a stepdam or a dowager, long withering out a young man's revenue. Four days will quickly steep themselves in night. Four nights will quickly dream away the time. And then the moon, like a silver bow, new bent in heaven, shall behold the night of our solemnity. Go, Philistrate. Stir up the Athenian youth to merriment. Awake the nimble and pert spirit of mirth. Turn melancholy forth to funerals. The pale companion is not for our pomp. Okay. Hippolyta, I wooed thee with my sword and won thy love by doing the injuries, but I will wed thee with another key, with pomp, with triumph, and with reveling. Great. Really what we've done is tried to uh, release the language in a physical way. You heard these vowels being extravagant, and this is that extravagance that we have to keep after because it is, uh, the words are saying a huge amount. I mean, they are like, you know, keeping the lid on the pot, as it were. And so we need to be able to feel truthful when we do that extravagance. And I think that's what we have to keep working between. Going to one extreme and then coming back to the thought and then really opening it out again like that. 
This danger erupts in a different way when Aegeus speaks. He is pleading for the right to dispose of his daughter in any way he chooses. The rhythm is cruel. We hear his agitation in the way his thoughts are broken up and his care to give due reverence to the duke, my noble duke, etc. His rhythms are very different from Theseus and Hippolyta. What I'd like to do now is just look very specifically at the structure. Can we just speak the words which, which grab us as he says it? Just the violent words, as it were, that could be violent. Okay, right. Happy be Theseus, our renowned duke. Thanks, good Aegeus. What's the news with thee? Full of vexation come I, with complaint, complaint. complaint. against my child, child. child, my daughter, Hermia. Daughter. Stand forth, Demetrius, Stand forth. my noble lord. My noble lord. This man hath my consent to marry her. Only the, only the violent words, yes. Stand forth, Lysander! Stand forth. And my gracious duke, this man hath bewitched the bosom of my child. Thou, thou, Lysander, thou hast given her rhymes and interchanged love tokens with my child. Thou hast by moonlight at her window sung with feigning voice, feigning. verses of feigning love, feigning. and stones the oppression of her fantasy with bracelets of thy hair, rings, gauds, conceits, snacks, trifles, nosegays, sweetmeats, messengers of strong prevail strong in unhardened youth. Unhardened. With cunning, cunning hast thou filched Filch. my daughter's heart turned her obedience, which is due to me, to stubborn harshness. stubborn harshness. And my gracious duke, be it so, she will not here before your grace consent Consent's to marry with Demetrius. I beg the ancient privilege of Athens, as she is mine, I may dispose of her, which shall I be either to this gentleman or to her death, death. according to our law, law. Immediately, immediately provided in this case. A word like filched. You know, Iago uses that word to Othello, and it's not just stolen, is it? <laughs> he's like, he just found out, and he's got all these rings, gourds, conceits in this, yes, in this yes. chest of drawers. And those are the things that have bewitched her. So they're dangerous things, aren't they? One thing I think we do forget in Shakespeare is that when you uh, talk about um, sin, you really mean sin, which is something quite concrete, which we don't know, which we don't view it today in the same way. Bewitched is something absolutely real and quite frightening. This isn't makes it? him very dangerous. Yes, which this is, is what so I was, disturbing because yeah. it is faintly ridiculous. Yeah. After what we saw before, but this makes him so dangerous. Yes. yes. And we have to take that very seriously because there are people who still who do believe in, in, in being bewitched, you know. So it is something that we can't speak about lightly. Yeah. You expect Lysander, when he said she'll die if she doesn't, um, yeah. you know, consent, you expect Lysander to say, look, I can't have this. She, you know, save her life, but he doesn't. Yeah. So it's like they've got this oh, thing and nobody is letting go and it's like yeah. that. But he doesn't say, yeah. no, okay. And that is the world we're, taking us, we're being taken into, that, the cruelty of that world, the societal values of it, which, <clears throat> which come down from the Duke. That is where all that language takes us into the whole society. We have to be clear about that. I really feel very strongly that we should just do this exercise on the beginning of Hamlet because it's an amazing piece of writing. It's usually done with a lot of soldiers and a lot of military stuff. I want to see if we can get somewhere in it just by listening to it. This exercise is totally about listening and what we hear. So the actors are going to different spots in this room, space, um, and we're going to first of all whisper it through, see what, hear 
rather, what that does to the language. How you speak at night in the dark is a different thing, isn't it? Mm. That is also a mystery. It's also mm. part of the mystery. <laughs> um, right, so can you go to your marks, as it were? Oh. Yeah, okay. Unfold yourself. Bernardo? You come most carefully upon your hour. For this relief, much thanks. Tis bitter cold, and I am sick at heart. Have you had quiet guard? Not a mouse stirring. Well, good night. If you do meet Horatio and Marcellus, the rivals of my watch, bid them make haste. I think I hear them. Stand ho! Who is there? Friends to this crown and liegemen to the dame. Give you good night. Oh, farewell, honest soldier. Who hath relieved you? Bernardo hath my place. Give you good night. Hola, Bernardo. Say, what is Horatio there? A piece of him. Welcome, Horatio. Welcome, good Marcellus. What? Has this thing appeared again tonight? I have seen nothing. Horatio says tis but our fantasy, and will not let belief take hold of him, touching this dreaded sight twice seen of us. Therefore I have entreated him along with us to watch the minutes of this night, that if, again, this apparition come, he may improve our eyes and speak to it. Tush, tush! It will not appear. Sit down a while. And let us once again assail your ears that are so fortified against our story what we two knights have seen. Well, sit we down. And let us hear Bernardo speak of this. Last night of all, when Yon same star that's westward from the pole had made his course to illumine that part of heaven where now it burns. Marcellus and myself, the bell then striking one. Peace, look where it comes again. In the same figure like the king that's dead. Thou art a scholar. Speak to it, Horatio. Look, looks are not like the king. Mark, Horatio. Most like. It harrows me with fear and wonder. It would be spoke to. Speak to it, Horatio. What art thou that usurps this time of night, together with that fair and warlike form in which the majesty of buried Denmark did sometimes march? By heaven I charge thee, speak. It is offended. See, it stalks away. Stay. Speak. Speak. I charge thee, speak. Tis gone and will not answer. Right. It is very dangerous, isn't it? Everybody's trying to establish something, so nobody's sure of anything. Well, that is the important thing, isn't it? Because they're not sure where they stand. And it's such a bit of play about power, too, so... Yeah. It's about insecurity, isn't it? Yeah. Is really what it is. It's almost like it's prose, but it isn't. So there are a lot of spaces in between because you've only got who's there. And then there's a space. Nay, answer me. Stand and unfold yourself. That's a whole line. And a single syllable. Long live the king. Bernardo. He. You come most carefully and then it's back into that. And then, have you had quiet God? Not a mouse. You know, there is that sense of suspense all the way through it. But practically from the actor's point of view, when you whisper what happens, you're taking your perception of yourself away. Now, I think that we all have a secret voice somewhere inside us, which we lost when we, went, when we started to go to school because we had to present ourselves in some way. But when you take that logic, your perception of yourself away, which is making sense of everything and making sure that everybody understands, you hear something in the words which is different. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. You hear what the words are doing. You start lifting the words through. And it has the most extraordinary effect on what the words can do, that they do more than you think they can do. I mean, it's a strange thing to do because yeah. your normal uh, 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 thing that you would think would be the thing that you'd want to do is actually, if you're trying to reach somebody on the other side of the room, is to raise your voice so they can hear you. Yeah. But actually to take your voice away and whisper to someone on the other side of the room seems slightly incongruous. It's like, mm. well... If he can hear you, everybody can. <laughs> so why whisper? You focus what you're saying directly at that person, yeah. so you're almost trying to get it past all these other people. Yeah. That are I had an image in the middle of it, but we were almost on top of the tower. So these are our watches, and we can't leave them. Yes. Yeah, we have to talk like, about There's this. not a law. Yeah, there's a law that you can't, you have to whisper because you can't make noise if you're on the watch. <laughs> <laughs> You'll lose your head. Yeah. But that, yeah. that he yeah. happens, his watch happens to be that far away, and we do right. have to discuss this. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. And, you know, the people yeah. are here, and also the ghost. Yeah. I mean, we don't want to. What so ghost? It, make... <laughs> it, makes, it makes it seem like there is somebody else there that you don't want to hear what you're talking about. Someone's always listening in this world. Yeah. Someone's yeah. always behind a door. Absolutely, that's brilliant. Right. That is brilliant. And, and it sets it up right here. That's great. Right. Yeah. The ghost in every play. <laughs> there is a ghost, yes. <laughs> it's really, yeah, right. And when, they, when Horatio finally does come in and see Hamlet, it's, it makes it all the more kind of yeah. exciting yeah. that this yeah. is obviously an obvious conspiracy. And all of this pomp, and suddenly one of the conspirators comes yeah. in and takes the prince yeah. and says, it's very closed. It's, it's very dangerous thing, thing, you know. Intimate situation. Because he says you come most carefully upon your hour. Carefully. Yes, in, in good time, I mean, promptly, I suppose. Isn't it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Promptly. Mm -hmm. yes. Well, maybe that's why Francisco's there, is that so that there's someone who leaves, so then once he's gone, we go. Yes. And come together. That there's yes. sort of a hello, okay, okay, yes. he's gone. What has this thing yes. appeared again? Yes. Da, 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 da. In the in the yeah. fear, yeah. there's a very good humor in the fear of <laughs> uh, when the ghost arrives going, yeah. You've read a book, speak to me. It's a relief when the ghost comes. <laughs> you know, and when he went, the, oh no! <laughs> this terror, because the tension is incredible up to this. I mean, the, the relief that. I don't know what that relief is about. The important thing is that we hear what is happening in that language. I mean, that wonderful thing about have you had quiet guard and it takes a moment, not a mouse. I mean, it, it has its own music, mm -hmm. it has its own sort of pace, its own spaces around it, which actually give it the suspense. It does, obviously, it isn't whispered. I'm only whispering to give us a feeling of that. But it is in those spaces between the language that the suspense is. And just the directness of it. You don't have to put anything on it. It can be quite plain, but it's there in the space. In the spaces between the language, there's a scream there, the scream between the <laughs> words. When we take our voice away and simply whisper, we hear everything differently. We hear the references to this thing, the other. We hear our secret response to what is happening in the language. I know I keep talking about this, but it is of the essence. How the vowels can stretch or be very short, the sharpness of the f or the fullness of the consonants, voiced or unvoiced. We hear the rhythms and suspensions in the line, like this, not a mouse stirring. By heaven I charge thee, speak. It is gone and will not answer. This thing, a piece of him, harrows me with fear and wonder. But so often we drown these textures by overlaying them with meaning, by that voice which we rely on to make sense. And when we do this, we lose a certain Mystery, the mystery in the language. In the next two pieces, we're going to focus on how the imagery, that is to say, the pictures we use to describe our feelings, tell us so much about the character. We will find exercises 
to do to draw this out. First, let us look at Brutus in Julius Caesar. He, along with the other conspirators, is contemplating the killing of Caesar, and we see him here thinking it out on his own. Should action be taken or not? It is a moral question. It is wonderful to hear what I call the ladders of thought by which he argues out his problem, his dilemma. How he has to justify himself that he is doing right. He has to climb the ladder of his images of his thought to come to a decision. Now in everyday life we all use images, by this I mean pictures to describe our feelings. In Shakespeare, the choice of image tells us so much about the character and the character's state of mind. It is where the character is, where the character is living. Let's listen and find out what we hear. What interests me very much is how our inner landscape informs our outer one, <laughs> informs what we do. And I think this is a very good illustration of what that is doing. Can we just listen to it and just very gently, without, uh, without reading maybe, um, mutter images that strike you, that grab you. Try to do it through listening and not through reading it. It must be by his death. And for my part, I know no personal cause to spurn at him, but for the general. He would be crowned. How that might change his nature, there's the question. It is the bright day that brings forth the adder, and that craves weary walking. weary walking. Crown him that, and then I grant we put a sting in him that at his will he may do danger with. The abuse of greatness is when it disjoins remorse from power. And to speak truth of Caesar, I have not known when his affections swayed more than his reason. But tis a common proof that lowliness is young ambition's ladder, whereto the climber upward turns his face. But when he once attains the utmost round, he then unto the ladder turns his back, looks in the clouds, scorning the base degrees by which he did ascend. So Caesar may, then lest he may prevent. And since the quarrel will bear no colour for the thing he is, fashion it thus, that what he is, augmented, would run augmented. to these and these extremities. And therefore, think him as a serpent's egg, which, hatched, would, as his kind, grow mischievous and kill him in the shell. It's quite difficult to follow the dialogue. Yes, it is. Both the internal dialogue and the external dialogue yes. is, is uh, quite difficult to find over the days I've been panicking over. <laughs> Great. <laughs> it really does seem to be a case where he's persuading himself. He hasn't made up his mind. Yes, it, it's still this question about when you do make up your mind, the moment you do, have you made up your mind before you start speaking and then you argue it through, firm it up and all those things. It's yeah. like if it were done, if, if it yes. were done when it is done. Yes. It's, it's <clears throat> that kind of um, complexity. It's like his imagination takes him to yes. the place. This is really, it, it's where imagination takes us, isn't it? Sorry, carry on. There's yes. a lot of snake images. Yes. Once you call somebody a snake, then your logical conclusion is that they're going to kill you. Yes. Mm. It's where those images take us, isn't it? And just as I believe there is no such thing as a disinterested action, perhaps there's no such thing as a disinterested image. And you also get the feeling that when he's spurn at him that he means it and therefore to a certain extent for the rest of the speech he's trying to find a justifiable reason to yes. dislike this yes. guy yes. He's making up things about yeah, yeah. he's yeah. trying he's, he's trying to be making up things yeah. he says he's, he's never known him not to use reason but once he gets power he'll start using yeah. emotion and not reason yeah. and that's something that he's you know just kind of formulating because there's no proof of that it's the whole thing of what if yeah. What if when this happens yeah. to him, he's like that? And yeah. what if it, when it, this happens to him, he's like that? And so, you know, just in case, kill him now. Yeah, let's kill him now. Yeah. Yeah. It's like Herod yeah. killing all firstborns. Yeah. Like in a way, it's almost as though the decision subconsciously has been very firmly made, and the rest yeah. is to bring it to the, to the conscious level yeah. and, and justify yes. it. And I think this is the question we always have to ask, and I'm not saying there's any answer, because the actor must choose, you know, must take that choice, him or herself.
There's also a thing you said yesterday about uh, the first line laying down the premise of yes. the, the dialogue. Yes. And that his first thing is, it must be by his death. Yes. This, this and it must could be, be a question death. almost, yeah. couldn't it? Yeah. That's it the important. To, he tries to argue that in a logical way, but actually his logic is fueled by emotion. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. the images are so powerful yeah. that they, it, the images yeah. affect him and his yeah. thinking. Yeah. Yeah. To me, it begs the question how much of it is a dialogue between him and himself and if he's on stage and using the audience exists so mm. is it to almost assign a meaning or a personality to them and get their permission for something you've already Could decided be, or yeah. or is it something you're working out by yourself you is it very much uh, depends on the convention that <clears throat> is put up during the play right, right. this speech is about Brutus himself <laughs> It's like Brutus looking in the mirror and seeing him. So it's like yeah. when artists say all self-portraits yeah. are really about yeah. the art. So all portraits, yeah. not self-portraits, but all the portraits, portraits are, really are about yeah. themselves. That's very good. You know, yeah. they might yeah. paint the Mona Lisa, yeah. but it's really yeah. about him. Yeah. It's not about the Mona Lisa. Yeah. You know, and it's almost like saying we would maybe get the underscore of that yeah. speech is, is about him. Because Brutus is an honourable man. He is yeah. a noble man. Yeah. His vanity comes through yeah. when he says... Because Julie sees it was from low status. Yeah. It's all about him, it's his vanity. Just question him gently as he goes. Just heckle him a little bit. It must be by his death. Wow. Wow. And for my part, I know no personal cause to spurn it. So but for the general, he would be crowned. How that might change his nature, there's the question. It is it. The bright day that brings forth the adder and that craves weary walking. Crown him I have asked them to heckle him in order to disturb the rhythm of his thoughts, disturb their logic and make them more surprising, for him to be surprised by them. It will make him have to be more precise with the words he chooses to define his feelings that much more clearly. This will then feed the action and the physicality of the language and open up the questions. The questions about how do we make up our minds? Who do we talk to when we talk to ourselves? The base degrees by which he did ascend. So Caesar may. May. Then, then, lest he may prevent. And since the quarrel will bear no colour for the thing he is, fashion it thus, that what he is augmented would run to these and these extremities, and therefore think him as the serpent's egg, which, which hatched would, as his kind, grow mischievous and kill him in the shell. What did you feel about that? Okay. I feel like to I mean, imagine it while you're acting would be brilliant. Yeah. How did that feel to you? That was very helpful. In, yes. in order to, to actually bring out the mm. internal yes. um, conversation that he's having mm -hmm. with himself. Conversation is the right word. The, the Not sense dialogue, of, conversation is yeah. right. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Yeah, because um, he's showing, he's, he's continually giving images, well, it's in certain places, images of, of goodness and deliberately balancing them with, with badness. When he says that it's the yes. bright day, it's a bright day, but bright days bring out the yeah. other, and yeah. therefore, you know, walk yeah. carefully. It's a constant... Um, uh, yes. juxtapositions of, yes. of all of the images that he's choosing yes. to pick out. There is a resistance in your mind yeah. to this. That's the thing, yeah. isn't it? I mean, it's almost like he's having a... F you know, the mirror image is very good, that he's yeah. having a, a fight with himself. If yes. Well, it's the yeah. obstacles. I mean, basically, yes. that's what... I mean, speaking methodies, you know, yeah. these obstacles are created that you can imagine, yeah. like, you know, we were saying, mm. it must, yeah. would be wonderful, then, to have this exercise to help you when you're standing there on stage by yeah. yourself. Yeah. And it also... To spur you on. Then can't help but move from being in any way reflective yeah. Jumping to being ultimately yes. active. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And mm -hmm. which is, I mean, I loved listening to you do it on the floor. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think somewhere in the middle is probably the yeah. best. Yeah. It's almost too. <coughs> yeah, it's exactly. like I like, I like yes. you thinking it through, yeah. but it, but it's, it's such an obviously an freedom. active speech. Yeah. Yeah. But it's also the f what um, I can't remember what the exercise we, it was we d we did earlier. Um, but the fear of actually speaking the words, actually to have these thoughts, yes. it was the Macbeth mm -hmm. thing. If it were yeah. done, when it is done, yeah. the actually to contemplate yes. um, assassination. Yes. in itself is treasonous. Yeah. The, the sense of even yeah. thinking these yeah. things are, are as dangerous yeah. as doing them. Yes. But you're, it's actually your first statement is that you've, you've jumped into the breach by saying it must be by his death. Yeah. The rest of the speech is you kind of justifying yeah. that mm -hmm. statement. It's a bungee you know. jump, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. 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 I'm going to take it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
by the end he convinces himself that he's saying something brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Starts off doubting it. Actually, no, that's a really good image, and that it's brilliant. And yes, I mean, yeah. it's like it's wonderful how he introduces when he introduces the image of the the ladder. And he follows it completely through. It goes on for one, two, three, yeah. four, five, six, seven lines almost. And he like it goes all the way through. I mean, it's kind of like a ladder, kind of like the way he yes. creates the image. And like that last argument kind of rolls and rolls and rolls, and it kind of yes. builds and builds. And then it, it, it kind of comes to such a conclusion yes. at the end. Kill him in his shell. He gives himself a, a, um, a like a, um, a hook where mm -hmm. you imagine that when he actually goes to kill Caesar, what he's thinking is he's a serpent's egg. And that's the final hook that yes. he's given himself after all that the talking. That is where he is, he's kind isn't of got, it? That's is where his a, psyche yeah, is he's on He's not a man, serpent. he's a serpent's egg. Yes. He's not a man, he's a serpent's egg. Yes. And I can kill a serpent. Make it quite, it's, it's quite frightening, really, yeah. that yeah. Uh, rhetoric can be used for self-deception. Yeah. 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 The last line yes. is a half line. It feels to me like he's, I've got it now, so yeah. get yeah. it. Kill him. Yeah. Don't yeah. think one more thought or I'll lose it. Yeah. Nothing else. That's it. He's a serpent's egg. and. We're going to kill him. Just dead. dead. That's it. Now, nobody say anything. Yeah, nobody say anything. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you think it works on us as well? It makes us think about our own ambition, what we are like. Oh, yes. So it's very democratic in a way, isn't it? Because yes. it makes us think, yes. well, we, yes, could we be like that? But we're not in the position well, that Caesar's in. Well, I think he's always questioning us. I mean, hopefully, Because he speaks to the senators. Does question, doesn't it? And it's about, you know, where, where, what yeah. are you in this for? For yeah. fame or for... Yeah. But he'd also got you know, how reasons. people like Hitler got to power, doesn't it? You know, and all those you know, horrendous Questions our things. own consciences. Yes. And that's what's really powerful yeah. about it. When do you say no? It's saying, isn't it? When do any of us say no? He should when, be when do actors <laughs> say no? <laughs> you know. I mean, all these exercises I keep repeating, but it's important that they're just ways in to finding First of all, the ambiguity and all, because that's what's so wonderful about Shakespeare. It, it's speaking to so many sides of us all the time, so many rooms inside us. Now to a speech from Romeo and Juliet. Juliet's soliloquy when she is told that Romeo has slain Tybalt. She is being torn between her love for Romeo, her husband, and her love for Tybalt, her cousin, whom she also loves as part of her family, which is very close. Now, for me sitting here doing this, I have to say this out loud because this is a rehear this is a, a working thing. Yeah. Because this is such an emotional speech that yeah. I can't just go flying into this. No, no, no. You just want me to read this. I just want you to read it without even just, worrying about it. Just no, say. Yeah. Good. <laughs> <sighs> oh, serpent heart, hid with a flowering face. Did ever dragon keep so fair a cave? Beautiful tyrant, fiend angelical, dove-feathered raven, wolvish ravening lamb, despised substance of divinest show, just opposite to what thou justly seemst, a damned saint, an honorable villain. O nature, what hadst thou to do in hell when thou didst bower the spirit of a fiend in mortal paradise of such sweet flesh? Was ever book containing such vile matter so fairly bound? Oh, that deceit should dwell in such a gorgeous palace. It's antithesis, really, we're talking about. And so nearly, I mean, all Shakespeare is built on that antithesis. And what is interesting about these opposites, that it presents us with a whole spectrum of experience mm. immediately, just in that. Just do it one more time, and you repeat the antitheses as, as you go. Oh, serpent heart, hid with a flowering face, did ever dragon keep so fair a cave? Beautiful tyrant, fiend, angelic. This speech is full of antithesis, ideas which are opposite, images which are opposite. And this tells us something of the extremity of her feelings. Let's listen. A damned saint. An honorable villain. Oh, 
nature, what hadst thou to do in hell when thou didst bower the spirit of a fiend in mortal paradise of such sweet flesh? <coughs> Was ever book containing such vile matter so fairly bound? Oh, that deceit should dwell in such a gorgeous palace. There is in the kind of, um, the, so the emotion of it, a real kind of uh, sense of a kind of, ah. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, it's very kind of open. It's like an, uh, uh, a wound. Yes. It's, it's, it's like split open. Yeah, yes. it's a real, it's yes. like the whole thing is done on, on yes. a kind of a whale. And you don't know what to think. You, you, you're not left with anything to hang on to except yeah. a feeling. Mm. It's almost like when something shocks you and the illusion, someone that seemed this is now this. And for Juliet to me, it's like a, the purity of love and the innocence of it now being marred. Yeah. Yeah. And you yeah. must deal with that on, on the moment yeah. to say, that's not the way it was. Yeah. And, and to struggle with it. This thing with a like, beautiful tyrant and it's fiend, angelic. It's, it's like, I feel, yes, no, He's wonderful. I hate him, but you know, it's he's that all that. Yeah, it's, and it's a wonderful image to it in such a gorgeous perch. And it reminds one of uh, Galloper Pace when mm -hmm. I bought the mansion of a love, oh, but not possessed it. Yeah, I want you to try and get out of this circle. I'll try and get out. Yeah. Okay. Right. Right. Oh, serpent's heart, hid with a flowering face. Did ever dragon keep so fair a cave? Beautiful tyrant, fiend, angelical, dove feathered raven, wolvish, ravening lamb. Despite something of the party show, just opposite to what thou just he seems to a damned saint, an honorable villain. What hast thou to do in hell? And now didst bower the spirit of a fiend in most paradise of such sweet flesh. Whatever book containing such vile matter so fairly bound. Deceit should dwell in such a gorgeous palace. <laughs> <laughs> I can't bear it. All right. <laughs> but it works. Uh, yes. So many of his finding words. Yes, that's right. exactly what came out. That you had Sorry. to find the words to get through. <laughs> Is it to use the words, or sort of hoping the words will open? It, it's if, been, if, if I choose the right words, yeah. I will be out of this hell. I mean, I, oh my, I'm yes. I mean, what it was wonderful that. about that—it put the whole woman's condition in there. By wasn't closing, it? And you're closing, and up. how can I get out of this and still maintain what I used to? It's like I yes. know how wonderful he is, and now it's not wonderful. But I can hold on to how wonderful. Right. Can't get out. Yes. Can't get out of the thought that this yes. is bad. He killed Tip. The, the, you know what I'm saying? It's like the word, like it coming in through the action made me then feel it on the inside. Yes. Rather than the outside feeling it. Yes. And understanding it way. from the outside. You feel that way. It's, it's, it just seems impossible that you'll feel any better, you know, that you'll ever get out yeah. of that black hole. It's like when you were scared to start when you said, Tess, this is a really emotional speech. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, but Shakespeare is so good that he actually, out of that emotion, he channels the emotion and gives you the, the images. Mm -hmm. And the images are what... Bring you to uh, it. And which, which, in a funny way, take away the dramatic yeah. kind of, I don't know, indulgence of what might happen yeah. if you do it. Because he's actually giving you... Try, it's like you're trying to stop... You're trying to stop the scene, be dramatic. Yeah. By you, you're holding on to these images. Yeah. And that's all you have to hold on to that scene. Or else it would just become this huge emotional sort of scream. But yes. they keep bringing you down, they keep sort of saying, no, I can work this through, I can work this through. And yes. Shakespeare gives you those images that come out of that. Yeah. Okay, but my, my feeling too is like we could have 
what you just said, you have to have all that going on to keep you anchored. Yes. Ra you rather than yes. making it a rhetorical, poetic yes. Yes. reading. Of course. Yes. Which I think is always... Exactly, you see. And I'm not... Yeah. So can you sit in the middle? Yes. And can you just walk around her so she, you're like threatening for her, but you do it quite quietly yes. there? <laughs> so good heart. Hid with a flowering face. Did ever dragon keep so fair a cave? Beautiful tyrant. Fiend angelical. Dove feathered raven. Wolvish, ravening lamb, despised substance of divinest show, just opposite to what thou justly seemst, a damned saint, an honorable villain. O oh, nature, what hadst thou to do in hell when thou didst bower the spirit of a fiend in mortal paradise of such? Sweet flesh. Has ever book containing such vile matter so fairly bound? Oh, that deceit should dwell in such a gorgeous palace. What I really felt on that one was that she was innocent and that she was beginning to lose that innocence. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's yeah. the terrible struggle. Because yeah. yeah. each image, she really does have to find. Because yeah. if it just comes to you straight right. away, then yeah. you've lost your innocence already. That's exactly. Yeah. Right. She, yes. that's, that's her... Yeah. You know, yeah. that's you, heard, you heard the cry. In the sense of... In the, all, in the images of the kind of breathing, it was like, you know, when people are really, really upset that, uh, or crying, that things come out in, like, spurts. So, so it's kind of like... You're controlling it, and then you're bringing your breath to the point where you can just say that, and yeah. then it's too much, and then you can say that, and then you have to bring it back, yes. and then you can say that, and then you bring it back, and then she finally, after the really, almost the longest spurt that she has, at the end of it is, oh. oh. Yeah, and, and it, it just really like, came from right it down there, Thank you. That's been a wonderful exercise. It has actually fulfilled so many things about how you have to feel wild. I mean, the wildness of this feeling, and yet, if it is contained, you know. And looking for the word, looking for the images. Yes, yeah, exactly. Said. It almost gets wilder because it is contained. That's so, it? I've never thought, I've yeah. never experienced it. Thank no, you. Really good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just go over some of these antitheses again. Beautiful tyrant, wolfish ravening lamb, fiend angelical, serpent heart hid with a flowering face, damned saint, honorable villain. She is truly distraught. The extremity of her language says it all. <laughs> Let's look at another speech which, like Brutus, shows us a character thinking through a problem and looking at the possibility of action or non-action. Macbeth. Listen for that word, if, and for the short vowels and sharp consonants at the beginning. If it were done when it is done, and were well it were done quickly, if the assassination could trammel up the consequence and catch with his surcease success, that but this blow might be the be-all and the end-all, here, but here upon this bank and shoal of time, we'll jump the life to come. But in these cases we still have judgment here, that we but teach bloody instructions which, being taught, return to plague the inventor. This even-handed justice commends the ingredients of our poison chalice to our own lips. He's here in double trust. First, as I am his kinsman and his subject, strong both against the deed, then as his host, who should against his murderer shut the door, not bear the knife myself. 
Besides, this Duncan hath borne his faculties so meek, hath been so clear in his great office, that his virtues will plead like angels, trumpet-tongued against the deep damnation of his taking off, and pity like a naked newborn babe striding the blast, or heaven's cherubim, horsed upon the sightless couriers of the air, shall blow the horrid deed in every eye that tears shall drown the wind. I have no spur to prick the sides of my intent, but only vaulting ambition, which o'erleaps itself and falls on the other. What I'd just like to do is one exercise with it, all right. What I'd like to do is go to one side of the room and crouch. But when I say run, move to somewhere else and crouch and do the next bit. Really? <laughs> is that all right with you? Well, I'm, I'm not good at crouching. <laughs> Well, you don't have to clutch. No, I mean, I can... You just look at that. You mean... Like, make him no, crouch. no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you please. That's exactly what it we mean. Maybe. Yeah. Don't clutch. Just run to somewhere else. Quite quiet. If it were done, when it is done, it were well, it were done quickly. Run. The assassination could trammel up the consequence and catch with his Cersei's success. Run. But this blow might be the be-all and the end-all. Here, but here upon this bank and shoal of time, we jump the life to come. Run. But in these cases, we still have a judgment here that we will teach bloody instructions which, being taught, return to plague the inventor. Run. Even-handed justice commends the ingredients of our poison chalice to our own lips. Run. He's here in double trust. First, as I am his kinsman, and his subject strong, both against the deed. Run. Then it's his host who should against his murderer shut the door, not bear the knife myself. Run. Besides, this Duncan hath borne his faculties so meek, hath been so clear in his great office, that his, that his virtues will plead like angels, trumpet-tongued against the deep damnation of his taking off. Run. Pity, like a naked newborn babe striding the blast, or heaven's cherubim horsed upon the sightless couriers of the air shall blow the horrid deed in every eye that tears shall drown the wind. Run. I have no spur to prick the sides of my intent, but only vaulting ambition, which all leaps itself and falls on the other. Great. Wow. Yeah. Jeez. Okay, so what about that? Well, it was, a, it was what you said, which I didn't actually think would happen. <laughs> of course. <laughs> because why should I trust you? No, no. <laughs> no, don't, please. You're from across the... No. Absolutely. Uh, no, it's, no, it's fascinating because you said it's like going to different places in your head. And what's so hard about Shakespeare sometimes is the enormity yeah. of, the, of what you're contemplating. It's something we don't know how to f often fill. Because it's, I mean, to, I mean, contemplating killing someone, we, although we've all felt that at some point, but it's not yeah. something, it's not a, yes. you know, so it, it does go to different places. It's a different place in your brain. And just like yeah. you said, if you, if you move, it's like you're in a, in a different place in your head, which actually started to feel like that. You do go to different rooms, don't you, in your head <laughs> quite a lot. Yeah. Film work and I have to do a really emotional scene. It just helps so much to uh, stir the emotion inside of me when I just start, you know, walking around the set mm. or mm. just or walking in circles or mumbling to myself and just getting my body moving gets yes. all, everything yeah. else going as well. But the important thing is about this is how he argues it through, right. isn't it? It is a, a debate going on in his head. And then you notice that thoughts are quite short at the beginning, and then they get longer and longer, and it becomes almost crazy, doesn't it? I mean, the, the images get so huge right. that he's almost lost there. And it, it takes Lady Macbeth to come on and say, 
bring him back down to sense. Right. But that is what I want you to find, the different spaces, the way, the energy that comes from thought to thought, from, from thought structure to thought structure. Really. Right. Okay, now the question is then, you know, to do an exercise like that and then to be able to be in one place. And do it. And do it. Yes. I mean... Do you have a pill? <laughs> I don't actually have a pill. No. <laughs> <laughs> but it's something that if one was working in a production, one would keep on um, going between, looking for the thought, the emotion, the motive, the character, the situation, and then just giving themselves over to speaking it in some right. way. Right. And gradually the two things right. hopefully come together, right. that one informs the other. But you're quite right, you've got to keep questioning it. Victor, when we're in a lot of trouble, we contain it so well, kind of not letting other people right. see it. You, you might be going through absolute hell, but it doesn't look it. You still, yeah. don't you? You don't go like that? Yeah, it's just, it's just uh, getting to that place, sort of being able to... Well, it's mm -hmm. acting, isn't it, really? <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful how quick, I mean, Against the thing all tongues speak of him, I mean, that, how long that took. If it were done when it is done, then to all it were done quickly. Can you feel? It's amazing, isn't it? It and made it seem urgent and important suddenly. He had to get there for yeah. the next thought, and he had... And that yeah. made me think, oh, someone's life is in the balance, rather yeah. than yeah. if he's contemplating it... And that wonderful word, headed. if, that he begins with, if mm -hmm. it were done when it is done. Another thing that was really interesting to notice is, like, Victor, you were saying, the emotional obligation of these huge things that you wrestle with that these plays are about, particularly something like this, mm. when you physicalize it by running from it and, mm. you know, if it mm. becomes a really active thing like the running or the paranoia in the mm. Leontes, it takes the obligation off of you to somehow, we, you know, we create this emotion through yeah. tension, which just makes something more yeah. general. That's and, the uh, thing and we have to learn, right? so isn't you, it? Yes. You go and you go, okay, so just I'm yeah. running from this and I gotta get away from it. Yeah. And then it yeah. becomes authentic. Yeah. Because because you're actually doing yes, it. Right? Yes. And then there's a million ways that you could actually yes. do that in a more yes. you yes. Know, contained way. Exactly. But That's great. Yeah. What? We'll just talk later. <laughs> yeah. We'll have a drink later. I'll, I'll fix you up. <laughs> right. So really what we have been looking at is how the thought develops in, within a speech, how the thought, and it grows and grows and grows and comes to some conclusion and the texture of the language, basically, in that, isn't it? In both those speeches, the texture of the language is very different. The lengths of vowels, lengths of consonants. We hear how the whole speech is given its dynamic by that word, if. It is as though it is all worked out in the moment of speaking it, how the thoughts are sparked off. They jump start us to another part of his world. Notice how the images get more elaborate and confused as he goes on, and we begin to doubt that he will go through with the action. And now to a very different movement of language. It is from Hamlet, and at the heart of the play. Ophelia has been devastated by her encounter with Hamlet, who has behaved like a madman. He has reviled her with his disgust, not only of herself, but of the world. She believes him to be mad. Just listen to the rhythm of this, and to the lengths in the vowels, and how that gives the movement of the lines, and what this tells us of her state of mind. Oh... What a noble mind is here o'erthrown. The courtiers, soldiers, scholars, eye, tongue, sword. The expectancy and rose of the fair state. The glass of fashion and the mould of form. The observed of all observers quite, quite down. And I of ladies most deject and wretched that sucked the honey of his music vows. Now see that noble and most sovereign reason, like sweet bells jangled, out of tune and harsh, that unmatched form and feature of blown youth, blasted with ecstasy. 
Oh, woe is me to have seen what I have seen, see what I see. I want you to go over to a corner and crouch. He is going to come round after you. He is Hamlet in your mind. And so, <laughs> and so when he gets near you, you have to run somewhere else. Stop speaking and run somewhere else and then say the next bit. It's, what, it's, it's like you're running away from him. Okay. Oh, what a noble mind is here, O oh, throne. The courtiers, soldiers, scholars, eye, tongue, sword, The expectancy and rose of the fair state. The glass of fashion and the mould of form. The observed of all the... The observed of all observers. Quite, quite down. And I of ladies most deject and wretched that sucked the honey of his music vows. Now see that noble and most sovereign reason. Like sweet bells jangled out of time and harsh, that unmatched form and feature of blown youth, blasted with ecstasy. Oh, woe is me, to have seen what I have seen. See what I see. It's a kind of dawning on you. It's like there's something there in your head, isn't there, that mm. is, is haunting, is it? Mm. What did you make you feel? Scared. It's like the words don't come out in their natural set form yes. it breaks things it up breaks for it, you yes. it's it like becomes a, jagged in a way yeah there's yeah. another yeah because it is such a kind of the form of the speech is so regular mm. Mm. somehow i couldn't even hear the words it seemed like the other side that all i heard was o and e so that it was mm -hmm. o and then like in revelation e like when you see something it's like oh and then when when it really dawns on you what it is, it's like, eat, like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A lot of the exercises we're doing too, the people who do them feel paranoid or afraid or scared, or you know, that's been a common reaction. Maybe because, um, well, when you face your feel fears, uh, really powerful things come out of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You use things. You resort to instinctively to things that you would in like a panic situation and also i think it's that sometimes the thing about shakespeare is that partly because of the language sometimes it protects you from the emotion very good of the of the of the piece where it simply becomes a kind of well-spoken thing because it's beautifully spoken what you do is you concentrate on speaking it beautifully mm -hmm. and you forget that actually what he's talking about is stuff that is raw emotion yeah. whether though that raw emotion is happiness or sadness or fear or passion mm -hmm. and but be, because of the beautiful language and you mm -hmm. concentrate on speaking it well and concentrate on the the, yeah. the iambic yeah. that sometimes one of the things that happens quite a lot is that you separate from whatever the emotion is not necessarily that it's yeah. a, um, a you know a, a, a full-on emotion yeah. but you hit it, the danger is that it separates you from it as well. Yeah, but in the end, it's, we've got to put the two things together yeah, yeah. like we are trying to do, yeah. but it, it seems like we've got to do that as well, and that now just come in the middle and speak it, just with the idea of defining your feelings, because that in the end is what words do, isn't it? It defines your feelings, defines what you're thinking and define. so find that definition of it almost as if you're writing it. Oh, what a noble mind is here, O oh, throne. The courtiers, soldiers, scholars, eye, tongue, sword, the expectancy and rose of the fair state. 
the glass of fashion and the mould of form, the observed of all observers, quite, quite down. And I, of ladies most deject and wretched, that sucked the honey of his music vows, now see that noble and most sovereign reason like sweet bells jangled out of tune and harsh that unmatched form and feature of blown youth blasted with ecstasy oh woe is me to have seen what i have seen see what i see Hate, yes. It's language going through you, basically, isn't it? And yet defining it. I was really struck by the line, the, the glass of fashion and the mould yeah. of form. Yeah. Just yeah. thinking about the shape of the whole speech and how regular it is. Yeah. And yet it indicates this yeah. terrible fear and turmoil. Yes. Yeah. Extraordinary. So she's actually, yes. It is a very bizarre thing to say, really, to all those things. She sort of lists yeah. all his accomplishments. That is what the court would expect, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. You see, I mean, it's very much because, in fact, they have heard all this, haven't they? Polonius has been hiding and he heard all this. Don't worry about telling us, we heard it all. Uh, it's horrendous, that. You know. Yeah. And she said, quite, quite down, kind of. It was like a bell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, brilliant. Equally. Yes. Bom, bom, bom. Sounded like a bell to me. And then yes. when he says, sweet bells jangled out of time, I thought, yeah, it is. Yeah. Oh, fabulous. Yeah. That's great. Yes. It's really kind of delicate, though, isn't it? It's kind of like winter time. It's like crystal, you know. It's like just like you know snowflakes almost. They're just so kind of easily crushed. Mm. Our images, like like Paul was saying, the glass of what you know, mm. was it the, the glass of fast glass things. Yes. Things yes. that are, things that are quite beautiful to look at, but mm. can be crushed yeah. and really easily. Yeah, and splinter. Yeah. It's really. And the blown youth as well. It's like a. It seems like a kind of like a flower that's yeah. opened out and is about to go. You know, it's like the petals are going to fall off. Yes. <laughs> Now, to measure for measure, in this speech, Isabella is working out a problem of conscience. Her brother Claudio has been condemned to die for having had unlawful intercourse with Juliet, who is pregnant by him. It is against the law. But Duke Angelo, who has enforced the law, lusts after Isabella and makes a bargain with her. If she will sleep with him, he will set her brother free. What irony. Her dilemma is that she must choose between her chastity and her brother's life. One or other has to be sacrificed. <laughs> It's so, it's so difficult for us to, to even deal with the thinking in this. And yet that, that word request of something so awful. Yes. Mm. 
Yes. So that sets up the whole a world yes. which we have to, as I said, yes. embrace. Otherwise, yes. you can't begin to yes. do it the about, play. It's about govern, governing as well. The governing power. Mm. This government, this government is corrupt. Mm. Her government, God, is incorrupt in, in the absolute sense. She will not corrupt mm. herself. Yes the way he has corrupted himself mm. in his office. She won't do it. Mm. She will die for what mm. she believes, mm. which is true of anyone who truly believes in anything. They will die for their belief, mm. whether it be war or, or anything. Mm. The pain of it is it's your brother. And now, now her, her faith is being tested in this, what she believes. It all relates to, yes. to the society that you live in. And when the, the head is to corrupt, the, to the, the body yes. suffers. The body of politics yes. suffers. Exactly. And that's why it's so dangerous. To yeah. So everything has to be injected, it has to be measured against that, the society that is ruling. And think about today, where the church has been corrupted with, with, with evangelists and money grubbing. They've corrupted the thing that God had set out for it to be. So it applies today in a very mm. interesting way. But these are the protestations that men in this time would have made. They'd be willing to die for family yes. honor. Yes. Mm. And her mistake, such as it is, if, if there is one in yeah. the play, is that she takes at face value. Mm -hmm. the principles of the society in which she lives. Mm -hmm. And that's what her innocence or naivety, as we might see it, tests. But we could set it in like in this time, but it would be the Godfather or it would be Islam. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there are people do and, and all over the world live by very strong principles, senses of honor. Doesn't she say somewhere in the play that if she does this thing, she condemns him also? So it's not as if, I think in her mind, if I, if I do this thing and save him, he is saved. Instead, I, she... He, he, he also loses in spirit, he is dead, so it's not as yeah, simple exactly. as more than yeah. our brother is, is our chest. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Our chest, yeah. my brother and my chest. Yeah. And in that world, it's the man who threatens her purity, therefore it is the man who saves her purity. But as a woman, she, she, she has no action. It has to be her brother. We have got to look at where the form helps all that. And I wondered if you two would mind sitting in the middle, back to back, leaning on each other, and doing the argument through, because I keep oh, the conversation she's having with herself. And you start, Latanya. To whom should I complain? Did I tell this, who would believe me? Oh, perilous mouths that bear in them one and the self-same tongue, either of condemnation or proof. Each actor is reading one whole sentence, either to a full stop or question mark, and by doing this, we will hear how Isabella is questioning both herself and her predicament. In other words, how she is thinking it through. Had he twenty heads to tender down on twenty bloody blocks, he'd yield them up before his sister should her body stoop to such horror. Then Isabel live chaste and brother die. More than our brother is our chastity. Hmm. I'll tell him yet of Angelo's request and fit his mind to death for his soul's rest. Okay. It seems like they have a, a short thought, or, the, or at least the first two first questions and then it just rolls into something and mm. then it stops and then there's another one I'll to my brother and then that yeah, rolls yeah, even okay. further and then it goes a bit wild doesn't it yeah. 20 when she's described the, uh, the, the, the the awfulness of the corruption yeah. and these horrible images of hooking things up and dragging them and mm. it's mm. a it's a very savage image that, that she yeah. paints there and then she goes immediately to the brother yeah. as the source of yeah. hope, security, yeah. sense, the good, the goodness. Lung, the that half long yeah. I'll yes. to my and brother is yes. 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 absolutely firm, isn't yes. it? Yes. 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 No other, and that's the end no other yeah. and course yes. possible. So there's no family, obviously. There's no mother, mm -hmm. there's no father in the play. It's sort of odd that you, in the, you don't ever see their parents. They're mm -hmm. not no. there. You, mm -hmm. So they're completely alone. They're left on their own devices. I really noticed the line where uh, she says, um, she's sort of putting it all on her brother, saying how wonderful and noble. And then he, she says, 
though he hath fallen by prompture of the blood, he's done exactly the same right. thing. Mm. Yes. It's quite ironic. Isn't it? And like, yeah, he's, but yeah, still he's honourable and still he can yes. die for my chastity. You know, it's like a complete hypocrisy. It's not hypocrisy. She's married. She's a married woman to God. In her, in not her, yet. But she's but taken the novice. road to be there. Her commitment is still there. You're right. I think the wavering is, is right because it's human flesh talking. There's a premise here that we don't, we're so, we're so hip. Yeah. We don't think about it anymore. Yeah. But, but it's still, there's a principle that still exists, whether we like it or we Absolutely. don't. Yeah, but then when she speaks, when she speaks, although she's insisting yes. on the principle, the way she speaks kind of gives a lie to it because it's more complicated than she will admit to herself somehow. Right. This part becomes doctrine. Part of it is doctrine versus part of what she actually feels. That's all I'm saying. True. But that Flesh and keep that in mind and just run over there and do it. Over here. Move any way you like for each new thought. To whom should I complain? Did I tell this? Who would believe me? Oh, oh perilous mouths that barren them one and the selfsame tongue either of condemnation or a proof, bidding the law make curtsy to their will, hooking both right and wrong to the appetite to follow as it draws. I'll to my brother. Though he hath fallen by prompture of the blood. This exercise helps us to pinpoint how each thought opens out a question, and that question leads us to the next thought. Her mind is continually provoking the next thought, and in the end, it leads her to this conclusion. More than our brother is our chastity. Isabel lived chaste, and brother died. More than our brother is our chastity. Yes, and that argument was so clear, wasn't yeah. it? Did you feel that? Yeah. Real sense, but the language of the term yes. moral absolutes. Yes. Yeah. Although she is, it's very complex in her head, yes. she is dealing with a moral absolute somehow. Yes. yes. I and I, she's. I heard this time so clearly was, I mean, unless I'm hearing it wrong, but I liked it the wrong way I was hearing it. Mm -hmm. Oh, perilous mouths that bear in them. That whole thing this time to me re refers to to whom should I complain? There's, there's no one that will hold the ambivalence of this, that there yes. is, it's easy for them, they'll just pick a right yes, or wrong yes, and say it's yes. simple, when the truth is I'm caught in this yes. ambivalence. I'm right. stuck between Absolutely. these two things that are both yes. so powerful. Yes. Can we have a uh, Lindsay now? Can we all stand up and just speak it in the middle again? Yeah. What I'd like you now to do is actually just start over there in a minute, <clears throat> and I want you to say a phrase, I want you to go up to somebody and say it part of it directly to them. Okay, so you go over there. And I want you to be walking around the room so she doesn't quite know where you where, where to where to go. When she comes up, you turn away. Right. So they're going to be walking all around the room. Okay. Just really hook on to somebody. Right. To whom should I complain? Who, if did I tell this, who would believe me? Oh, perilous mouths that bear in them one and the self-same tongue, either of condemnation or of proof, bidding the law make curtsy to their will, hooking both right and wrong to the appetite to follow as it draws. Oh, to my brother. Though he hath fallen by prompture of the blood, yet hath in he hath he in him such a mind of honour that had he twenty heads to tender down on twenty bloody blocks, he'd yield them up before his sister would her body stoop to such abhorred pollution. Then Isabel lived chaste and brother die. More than our brother is our chastity. <laughs> um, a, a desperate need yes, to convey yes. 
um, I mean, to justify a desperate yes. need. To I've make someone listen. Yeah. Yeah. The thing I felt is that you're almost immediately on um, your brother's side, not yours. That, that actually you're kind of, you, you feel for yeah. him. Yeah. And I don't know whether that's because of our relationship to God now, or our general kind of relationship to God, which is, oh, just, just sleep with the guy on this one night, for God's yeah. sake. Yeah. A couple of minutes, maybe. You know, it's... <laughs> a quickie. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, it so, it, I mean, that's the real, seems to me the real yeah. kind of yeah. difficulty yeah. Of, the, of the thing. That's the problem when you read it, you think, yeah. what, forgive me. Yeah. You're not going to let him die. But then when you speak it, you have no other choice yeah. but to commit totally mm. to that. Yeah. And then what happens between you and who's listening would be interesting. Yeah. The desperation of your argument is what led me to think, oh, she's wrong. She has to convince herself far too much for this right. to be right. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas, you know, um, there may be, say, uh, and Brutus, the same thing with mm. the serpent's egg. You think, mm. is there a clue in the way it's written how it should be played? I mean, is there, would the argument be a better argument if we, if he wanted if he didn't want the desperation? Yeah, uh, the desperation is only there to release certain things about the argument, just so we're letting to how people's minds tick and what makes them do something. That's the bottom line of it. All these soliloquies have been an attempt to explore how the language informs our search for the character, the rhythms, the structures of thought, the imagery, the very choice of words and sounds, they all take us to the very center of the character and to the predicament of that character. In the next tape, tape three, we will be looking at the differences between speaking prose and verse. How prose has very specific rhythms of its own, often more difficult to pin down. We will also be looking at some passages of dialogue to find the shared energy, shared cadence and music in a text with more than one character, and how actors can use this to give energy and suspense to a scene. And we will end by looking at a piece of modern text a speech from Edward Bond's Lear. We will take a speech from the play and work on it using exercises which we have already done on the Shakespeare texts, and we will see that these exercises can open up modern text for the actor in very similar ways.